May our almighty God, omnipotent God, bless you, bless you all, and that we never grow weary of seeking his face, praising his name, and calling upon him. May the Lord bless you all in every place, every city, town, country that in this moment have the chance to tune in and join us through this channel. And you will be participating in the sermon. And please excuse me, because my sermons lately have been a bit long and time goes by quickly. But what happens is sometimes in order to understand things, we have to go in depth and read many verses of the Bible in order to analyze, understand, and comprehend better. Because why would we want such a short sermon, only half of it, where a lot of things are not understood and may be left in the air, a lot of questions are left. So the sermon sometimes can be a little long and people ask that they didn't understand this or that. And so please excuse me. We're taking advantage of this situation, this pandemic, taking advantage of the time that the brothers and sisters are not able to congregate in the churches and people have not been able to go and receive prophecy and to receive the spiritual gifts. So patience and we are doing something different, something different from the ordinary of what we normally do when we go to church, when we go to the congregation. This is why, as we're doing so many different things, well, we overlook a lot of things as well. We're singing and praising the Lord differently. But either way, everything that we do, everything we are doing, we're doing it with our heart. And what we do, let us do it with our heart. And let us ask the Lord to help us. Because without God, life is difficult. If having the Lord, we have tribulations and moments of difficulty in our life, well, the devil is always there persecuting us in one way or another. Now imagine walking life without God. The, dif the situation is even harder because a woman or a man without God, they don't have anyone to go to. No one who will support them or help them. Help them and aid them in that moment. They have no one to call upon. There are many people who don't believe in God. And in those moments of sadness, tribulation, bitterness, I don't know what they do or what they feel because they are alone. There is no one to hear them, no one to watch them, no one to lend a hand, no one to help them out of their conflict or tribulation. This is why let's not be stubborn in saying, I don't believe in God, because a God exists. There is a superior being that governs us, a being that governs nature. And in our stubbornness, we will not win or overcome. So humbleness, meekness, lowliness is very important for human beings so that in this way, God may have pity and have mercy and help us. And so today, I, I wish you all for God to bless you and for God to be with you and that God may hear your prayers, that God may keep all of your needs in mind in these days, in these moments of tribulation, and that all together, united with one accord, asking the Lord in prayer, you ask for your need, and we here, we ask for the needs of all. In this way, I know God will act and will proceed. God will manifest himself. And so before beginning the sermon, we're going to sing to the Lord with our heart, with our natural instruments, our heart, our mouth, our throats, our tongue. We're going to sing to the Lord and we will sing him. 72. Him 72 titled... We shall see the king someday. Himno número 72 en sus himnarios, la gloriosa aparición. Cantamos con nuestro corazón a nuestro Dios. 
Día de victoria y gran resplandor, cuando Cristo volverá. ¡Qué glorioso encuentro con mi Salvador! En las nubes se verá, en las nubes Él vendrá, en aquel día final. Cristo el Salvador muy pronto volverá, un gran día sin igual, día de gran gozo, día sin igual, cuando Cristo volverá. De esta tierra iremos a la celestial, Cristo allí nos honrará, en las nubes Él vendrá, en aquel día final, Cristo el Salvador muy pronto volverá, un gran día sin igual, oye la trompeta que anunciando está la venida del Señor ya no más dolores ni afán habrá con Jesús triunfó el amor en las nubes Él vendrá en aquel día final Cristo el Salvador muy pronto volverá, un gran día sin igual. Blessed and praised is the name of our God, and thanks be to the Lord for His mercy. And we thank our God for being attentive, having an attentive ear to our cry our needs and we thank this eternal just God this God is who we praise and who we glorify this God is who we preach so that you may open your heart to him and today we will be going over and remembering a marvelous teaching remembering that those who have converted to God, those who know the path of our Lord. The duty is to become temples or house of God. People, they have a belief in life of the temple or house of God. And today, people, when they say, well, the church, They imagine a physical building, a structure. Or when people say the house of God, they imagine a physical structure, a building in a place. Everything is physical. For people, that is the house of God or the church of God. But today, we will analyze and we will see that the church of God The temple of the Lord, or the house of God, it is nothing physical. It is not a physical structure. It is not the roof, or the walls, or the floors of the building. That is not the house of God, nor the temple. In the time of antiquity, it was in the In the time of antiquity, God ordered Moses to build a tabernacle. And God told him, build a tabernacle that the people may praise me, may honor me. And God gave him the measurements and he gave him the instruments and the materials 
He gave him all he needed, the finest of the things available in wood and metals and gold, silver, precious stones, all of the best, the best animal skins, very exotic, for the building of the tabernacle, the physical tabernacle, and to set it in a specific place. And there, in that temple, every Sabbath, the people needed to gather and perform their sacrifices and bring their offerings and their tithing and to come praise the Lord and glorify Him. And God had told Moses that He would be in that tabernacle. He said, I will be in the tabernacle forever. I will be in that tabernacle and I will manifest myself and I will be there forever. For that was what the Lord wanted. He wanted His tabernacle to be perfect and that those who came to that place to worship, they should be people that were without spot or sin, always obeying the Lord and keeping His commandments. And in this way, God ordered this tabernacle to be built, and many ages went by with this tabernacle until the King David was born, then his son Solomon. And Solomon built a luxurious, majestic, splendorous temple with all of the finest things that existed on the face of the earth, all of the most expensive things. That was the temple that God, that Solomon built for God. And the Lord said, I will manifest myself in that temple forever. But the Lord knew that the people would fail and that they would defile the temple. That temple would be defiled. The tabernacle of the Lord would be defiled with sin, with the abominations that the people would carry out there and also the foreigners. And as the Lord knew this would happen, the Lord changed. For the future, for those latter days, He changed His plan that in the future, after... The Messiah came, the Savior. He would be the one to build a temple or a house for God. And this would be forever. It would be everlasting. This is why when the Lord was speaking to David, and we're going to read a verse in reference to that, God spoke to David and said, You will not build a house for me. Your son will because I will be with him forever. But when the Lord said, your son, apparently it seemed it was like it was Solomon, but the Lord was speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, for he came from the seed of David. And so God spoke to David, but thinking of our Lord Jesus Christ, he was the son who would build the temple or the house for God that would be everlasting. It would be eternal. This place would be eternal. The ha temple or house, it is the same. And so today we're going to read concerning this so that now physically in the moment that we are living or after the gospel, after our Lord Jesus Christ, after our Lord Jesus, it's been over 2,000 years. I always repeat this because there are many people that are new so that they can understand. It's been over 2,000 years since our Lord Jesus Christ began to edify and build the temple for the Lord, the house for God. And even to this day that the gospel of our Lord is being preached, and we, we have had the great fortune, the great privilege of being guided by the Spirit of God and to be blessed and to be covered with the spiritual gifts and the presence of the Lord. So we've now learned what that temple in the house is, what the true temple and what the true house is. We, many of the brothers and sisters now know that the temple is our heart. The house is our heart. But it is better that we read the verses because there are many newcomers who want to learn and need to learn. And so today we say, as a word, as a saying, I'm going to church because, well, that's where all the people are gathered and congregated. And all together congregated, we form the church of God. And 
hopefully there were a place and that all of the believers who are in the world in different countries if we could all gather in one place at one time, I don't think in this lifetime that would be possible. But yes, to gather, and the Lord observes and says, Here is my church. This is my church. This is my temple. This is my house where I will dwell and I will be forever. Look at them, all the hearts. One heart of all of the thousands of heart, one heart is made my temple, my house where I will dwell. This is what the Lord would say. And this is what He wants. And so, today, we will be reading concerning the temple or the house of our Lord. And I said to you, today, people say, okay, well, I'm going to the church, I'm going to the house of God, or is this the church, is this the house of God? What should I say? What should I call this? How should I express myself? Well, in order to understand and comprehend each other, we do say, I'm going to church. But we know we now know that the church is us. We are the church. Our heart is the temple of God. Our heart is the house of God. But for you to be the temple of God or the house of God, we need to have certain requirements met. And this is what we're going to go over, how to meet these requirements. And so I say, I'm going to church or I'm going to the physical temple just I'm not going to say, well, I'm going to the physical temple. I'm going to that physical house to honor God. So we just say the more general term, I'm going to the church. I'm going to the temple. But we know, we know the true temple is spiritual. The true house of God is spiritual. And so we gather in this place, in this room where I am, there's about occupancy for about 800 people. And when the 800 people are here, we say, okay, we are here in the church, in this place, in this city. But I know that the house of God, the temple of the Lord is my heart. And I need to meet the requirements so that God may dwell in my life, so that he may dwell with me. I need to meet the requirements. So I hope that this is clear, this knowledge that we need to congregate because the Lord ordered that we congregate. For someone could say, well, as I'm the temple of the Lord and I am the house of God, well, so then why should I go to church? My home where I live, that's where I can seek God. But no, the Lord said you must congregate because we need to put to work and to function the spiritual gifts because there are many people that are sick, others who will get sick in the future, and they need laying on of hands. There are many people that need prophecy. Others, they need laying on of hands for deliverance to remove witchcraft and sorcery. And so this is why the Lord ordered to congregate. And the beautiful thing is the Lord ordered to congregate every day, not just one day as in the time of antiquity. In the time of antiquity, the Lord had established the Sabbath day. But our Lord Jesus Christ, as he had removed and abolished that law of Moses in the gospel of our Lord, he said, it is every day that you ought to gather to praise my name, to honor me, to glorify me, because all of you are my temple. All of you are my house. And so congregate as one to praise my name and also to work the spiritual gifts and lay on hands. For if you are at home alone in your bedroom and you go nowhere to congregate, well, then how will you lay on hands? How will you exert the spiritual gifts? How would you exercise them? You can't. How, how will you exercise them on those in your home? No. And if you're, those in your house don't believe, so then you need the congregation. The Lord is wise. And he was right in ordering us to congregate in a specific place, a room, uh, uh, a room, whatever you want to call it, a locale, a sh wherever you, whatever you want to call it, we must come together and congregate to work the spiritual gifts because we need to be the temple of God or the house of God. And the temple and house of God it is the hearts of those who've converted to God, of the children of God. So we will begin to read here in Genesis 28, verse 17. Genesis 28, verse 17. And I was saying to you that the Holy Spirit ordered us to congregate every day. 
For in the time of antiquity, as they only gathered on the Sabbath, but then when our Lord Jesus Christ came with his gospel, people began to congregate more days, and then people changed that Sabbath day to the Sunday to be able to rest. And so people created habits of only going to congregate on a Sunday. But God wants it to be every day, not just on a Sunday. Every day, the room or the establishment, that physical place is open so that people may come and congregate as a church and praise the Lord and put those spiritual gifts to function and work. This is why the Lord gave this order. And even to this day, there are many that criticize us and say, how is it possible that you have your doors open every day and every single day you have services? Yes, because the Lord must be glorified and exalted every day of our life. Just as we need to eat every day, we need we need that. So God also wants us to praise him. Our soul, our spirit also needs that rest, that refreshment each day. And this is why we gather. And there will be people who are not able to because maybe they're sick. Others because they're elderly and can't make it. And those that are sick can't go. Or those who work at that time of the day can't make it. Or those who go to school can't go. Or the mothers who have their young children and have to take care of them because the next day they have to go to school early. So the mothers need to be with their children getting ready at 6, 7 p.m. and they can't go to church. Church. They can't go to the congregation. And so these people, they find the time to congregate maybe at least three times a week or at least two times a week. Others can do so every day. It is not a human obligation that you need to come every day because I have a list here and a list of those who come and don't come. No, the Lord said every single day, the place, the room, the establishment, or we call it the physical church, every single day it is open so that people may come to receive the spiritual gifts, to receive and to give God and to receive from God as well. Prophecy, visions, dreams, testimonies. So as you can see, brothers and sisters, it is needed, and God was right, and he was wise and sane. Every single day, the doors must be open so that those who can come, they will go and congregate. And those who can't, well, then in their homes, they should pray. In the homes, they should take some time out to pray. And when they need prophecy, they need laying on of hands because they also need to congregate, well, then they know when they're, they have time to go and congregate. And I hope that I have made myself clear, brothers and sisters, and you understand, and those that are new and that are listening have understood. And we said Genesis 28, 17, because we're going to discuss the temple of the Lord. And we're going to realize that it is nothing physical. It is spiritual. Genesis 28, 17 says, now, in this chapter of Genesis, chapter 28, God appeared before Jacob in a dream in a place called Bethel. And he had this dream, and in that dream, he had a vision. And he saw, in verse 17, then Jacob rose early, now he was in his, he had a dream. Now he was sleeping, sleeping outside. And he woke up from his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Verse 17. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob was prophesying here. He did not realize that the Spirit of God was speaking through his mouth. And the prophecy was, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. But who was the house of God? Who was the gate of heaven in that moment? If he was sleeping, and it says that he had set a stone on his head, and he fell asleep in that place, in that land, and in that place which was called Bethel, but he was on the outskirts. And so 
Who was he referencing? Who was Jacob referencing in the prophecy he gave? He said, this is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Well, he was speaking of Jacob's heart. God speaking to Jacob through Jacob's mouth. God speaking to him and telling Jacob, your heart from here on out will be my temple. Your heart will be my house. Because from you will come a nation. Because you will have 12 sons, or you now have 12 sons, and they will be 12 princes. And of those 12 tribes, they will form the people of Israel. And so I will be there with them. And in the end, in the end, after the people of Israel will grow, and in the end they will fail, but in the end of all, there will come a great person. He will come from your essence, this great important person. He will come in the end, a Messiah, a Savior. And he will continue building this house, the temple, and it is his heart. In his heart, there is that temple, this house. And he will convert many, many will convert to me and will convert and become that house and temple. Their hearts will. And so we see here how God spoke in this way to Jacob. I assume perhaps Jacob didn't understand. We don't know if he did. But the matter is, is he believed the Lord and he continued in that path, obeying and subjecting himself to the will of God. And how beautiful it is, God speaking to Jacob, that he was the house of God, that temple of God. That was walking because he did continue in his journey. And so that heart, that temple, the house of God is the heart. But of course, we must take a look at the requirements in the end in order to have this privilege of being that house and temple of God. And we continue here in First of Kings. First Kings chapter 5, verse 5. First Kings chapter 5, verse 5. Now we pass over all the books of Moses and then follows Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and then following Samuel you'll find Kings. In First Kings chapter 5, verse 5 to take a look at what it tells us concerning the temple or house of God. Now here, this is a covenant with Solomon. Now Solomon, King Solomon, was ministering, or he was now in the function of king, and he made a covenant with a king. Now Haram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon. So it says that they had a covenant, the two of them, because Solomon needed materials, wood, to build the temple of the Lord. So Solomon speaks to this king, and here in verse 5, he says, And behold, I, verse 4, But now the Lord my God has given me rest, says Solomon to the king of Tyre, on every side. So God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil or occurrence. There is nothing that he fears. And he says, And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build the house for my name. And so it occurred. When David died, he gave instructions to Solomon, and he told him, You need to build the house of God, the temple of the Lord. Because the Lord did not permit me to do it, but you will. And now we know that the Lord our God was looking toward the future. And Solomon, he was that symbol of the son of King David. He was the symbol of the Messiah, of the Redeemer, of the Savior that would come in the future. Of that person that would come and he came from the seed of David. So this son of David, Solomon, he was symbolizing Jesus Christ, who was going to be truly edifying the true temple. Now, Solomon did build the physical temple because that physical temple, it also needed to symbolize that future temple that would be spiritual. This is why this temple needed to be made with the best and finest materials, the most precious materials. 
So we continue for God had great care that his temple, his physical temple would be made with the best things because the Lord said in the future, the heart of a man or woman, it needs to be this way with the best of things, the precious stones, the best gold, the best metals, the best woods. For this is how my children, my sons and daughters need to live. Very splendorous. This is what the Lord demanded. This is why later on we will be taking a look at the requirements. Here, these were physical requirements. Pearls, marble, gold, silver. And later on, we'll take a look at those requirements that will turn into something different. That gold and marble. So now 1 Kings 8. We're here in chapter 5, so we're skipping over to chapter 8. 20 and verse 27. Verse 20. So Solomon had already built the temple. In verse 12, it said Solomon built the temple and he was going to open it, inaugurate it, and he was going to dedicate it to the Lord for they were going to begin all of the ministering that needed to occur in the temple. So he prayed that day made a prayer and called all the people to come and there were sacrifices for the Lord. There was praises for the Lord on that day of the inauguration of the temple. And in verse 20, Solomon says, So the Lord has fulfilled his word which he spoke and I have filled the position of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. So Solomon was saying that he had already built this house or that temple just as God deserved with the best things. And so in this way, many people of the world came to observe the temple and to speak with Solomon and to meet him. And here Solomon, now we know that this is, there are other things here. And now what we're focusing and what we're investigating, or rather what we're doing is confirming or reaffirming the doctrine we already know that we need to be the temple of God, the house of God, and that should be our heart. And so here Solomon in 27, after in verse 20, he said that he had built that house of the Lord in verse 27, but will God indeed would it be possible that God will dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built? This was the very wise question Solomon asked. He said, well, I created this temple, luxurious temple, very valuable. Now, will God dwell there? How is it possible if the heavens of the heavens cannot contain the presence of God? How can this temple that I have built? So he was very right. With good reason, he thought this way, but nevertheless, he built it for that was God's will. And that was the order that his father David gave him. But here he was also magnifying the Lord, exalting God and giving God his place that who can contain him, who can resist him, the heavens of the heavens of the heavens. And there is a psalm that says that the earth shakes with the presence of our God. In your presence, the earth shakes, Lord. And so, our God is great and marvelous. He is powerful. But as you can see, his mercy, the mercy that God he gave his power and he distributes it. He gives a little bit in the hearts of men and women. He puts a little bit of his presence to convert the hearts of men and women, turn them into the temple of God and the house of God. That is the mercy of the Lord. Now let us go to Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, after Psalms, Psalms is somewhat in the middle of the Bible and then after that, you'll find Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah chapter 2, in verse number 3. The prophet Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, 
Those who are not able to find, write it down, and then you can go ahead and read back when you get some time. And here, in chapter 2, it speaks of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the kingdom of the reign of the desired of the nations. Verse 3, many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. Now let us notice here in this chapter of Isaiah, now this is speaking about the Messiah, the Savior of our Lord Jesus Christ in His coming when He was preaching the gospel. When our Lord Jesus Christ was preaching the gospel in Jerusalem, in His time, in those days, these prophecies came to pass. This prophecy written in chapter 2 was fulfilled. This prophecy here in Isaiah, and this is why we're going to read here, and it says, Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. This was in reference to Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ was preaching in Jerusalem. The people had heard that the Messiah was already present, and that the Messiah was working miracle signs and great deeds. And so people were curious. And they knew many things. Now, imagine the Lord gave revelation to, to some wise men, some, some wise men who lived there who were not Jews. They were not Israelites. And God revealed to them that the Savior had been born, that the Messiah had been born, the King of Israel, that the King had been born. And so the fame, the fame spread out through all the land. And all of the nations knew that the Lord Jesus Christ had come. And he was now, or now they were enjoying the Messiah there in Jerusalem. And so the people wanted to travel to meet him, to see him. And so it says here that many nations, many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to that mountain of, it, of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways. And now... If it were that they were going to the physical house, they were looking for a physical temple in Jerusalem. The physical temple, that physical house, would not teach them doctrine. It needed to be a person, a person, a being. And so it is speaking of Jesus Christ and the Messiah, the Savior. It says, He will teach us His ways, and we shall walk in His paths. For out of Zion, which is the same as Jerusalem, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, the law of Jesus Christ, the law of the gospel, not the law of Moses, for the law of Moses was already present for thousands of years. The law of Moses was in function. But this is saying, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now law and word, they are the same. And Zion and Jerusalem, they are the same. For it says, for out of Zion shall go forth the law. Or let me speak in different terms. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth the word of the Lord. So it was this being who was preaching his gospel. And this is why it said many people would come and observe and would be curious whenever they heard of the presence of God there in Jerusalem, the physical Jerusalem preaching the gospel. And so here we see that this temple, this house of the Lord, this house of God, the physical one, it was no longer valid. That house that had been built by King Herod, he had built that temple that was around when our Lord Jesus Christ was preaching. That temple was built by King Herod. And here it does not say that they were going to that temple, but rather they were going to that mountain, that, that king, to see that person who had been born and who was preaching, to be taught by them the ways, the doctrine, the law. Glory to the Lord, the pure gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what this verse was in reference and we give the Lord thanks for all of his marvels. And we are reading verse 3. Now, let us go to chapter 66. We are in Isaiah. And we were in Isaiah 3, but now we're moving on to Isaiah 66. In verse 1 and 2, which says, Isaiah says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne. And earth 
is my footstool. Now, when it says earth is my footstool, this is in reference to the hearts of men and women who are converted to God. Because those who are not converted to God, well, then the physical earth is then defiled with the sin and evil of mankind. So God cannot set his feet upon that. He sets his feet upon his followers, those who love him and keep his commandments. That is the earth. So heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool, meaning this is where I place my feet. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? So the Lord also asking, where is the house? Where are those who will build me a house and the place of my rest? Where? Well, in no place. Verse 2. For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit. But here again, poor does not mean poor in money, but poor in spirit, who is simple. And it says, and who trembles at my word? So someone who fears me, obeys me, is subjected to me. They submit to me. They seek me. They honor me. They, they are my house. They are my temple. Because a physical house, where will they build? In what place were they build me a physical house? Well, there is no physical place to be built for me, a temple or a house. It is in the heart of those poor in spirit, those who are humble and those who tremble before the presence of the Lord to praise him, to honor him, obey him and do his will. And so you see how beautiful the word of our God is and how beautiful it is when the Lord teaches us. And we say here, here, let's go to Mi Micah. Micah, which is before the New Testament, before Matthew, we have some small books before. Before Matthew, we have some small books, and in there you'll find Micah. And you can also search in your table of contents. You can find it quickly that way. You can search for that page and then quickly find the book of Micah. So Micah chapter 4. And it says, in verse number two, this also speaks of the reign of the Messiah, the reign of our Lord who would be ruling. And it is our Lord Jesus Christ in verse two, or rather verse one. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. We are in Micah. We are in the book of the prophet Micah. Now, in this time, our Lord Jesus Christ had still not come to the world. And this is why it says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days, meaning the time where Jesus Christ would be preaching in Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. This is why we say the Lord is King of Kings. He is the top of the mountains. That King of Kings and it says, shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow to it. This verse is very similar to the one we read in Isaiah. That says that many people would come to meet him. Yes. Because we realize, we see that physically, when our Lord was here on earth, and he was 33 years of age in Jerusalem. There were many people that were curious and traveled to see him. But after the Lord ascended into heaven, the people, as it says here, that all people shall flow to it. But it is no longer physical that people will take a plane or a, uh, a ship, a boat to meet him because the Lord is spirit. And as the Lord will be in the hearts of men and women, People will want to know the truth of God. People will want to know the path of the Lord. Where is the word of God preached? In what religion? In what denomination? In what church, as we call it? Because we call the physical place the church, but we know that is not 
completely true. And in order to understand, we do say this. Oh, in what church do they preach God's truth? Because I want to go there. And so someone says, well, go to my church. The Holy Spirit of God manifests itself. Go to my church for God speaks through the gift of prophecy. God speaks through dreams, visions. Go to my church because God made a miracle. He raised me up, delivered me. And so people begin to hear this and say, I want to know this. I want to go. I want to go to that place. I want to know about this. I want to have this experience. Take me to that place where you say God manifests himself. And so why is it God manifests? Well, he manifests in the congregation, in the congregation of men and women who love him, who follow him. And so people are curious and say, yes, I want to go. And this is what this is in reference to when it says that people shall flow to it. It doesn't mean that they will take a plane, a car, a boat, or whatever you want to call it, and go there. No. It is so close. The things of God are close and near. For the Lord said it would be in all the world. He would allow his true gospel to be preached in all the world. And as it is in all the world, well, in all the world, there are congregations where he is manifesting himself. And so people say, I want to go take me because I want to live the experience. There is this, there is when this verse comes to pass. When it says that it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains being Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, and it shall be exalted above the hills and peoples shall flow to it. And now we go to verse two. Many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. But when it says many nations, it doesn't mean that the nations need to move. It is God who moves himself. For example, in Australia, in New Zealand, There are many churches there, many congregations where the Holy Spirit manifests himself and the spiritual gifts are present and the Lord is guiding, giving advice, giving joy, peace, deliverance. God is manifesting himself. And so if the manifestation was here in the United States, then they would all have to come live here or go and live in Colombia or Panama or another country because that is where God is. No. When it says many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, it means let us believe. I want to go to that congregation, that church where you say God is manifesting himself. I want to know it. I want to know this congregation. I want to be in that church. And once a person who did live in another country and the church was not present there, they heard about our church in Colombia that God was manifesting himself, that God spoke and gave spiritual gifts and speaks through prophecy, visions, and dreams. That person said, I want to go, and they traveled. That person did take a plane and traveled to go to our congregation and said, yes, I believe. I believe because this is of God. And so this person converted, but was from a different country. So this person believed and searched and God gave him, gave him of his spirit. God gave him prophecy, gave him spiritual gifts. And he went back to his country and there he began to speak to people and they formed the church. And as you can see, the church of our God was formed. The person that, or what was moved, it was the Lord who moved to that place, that country to be with those who congregate and to be there in the hearts of men and women that love him. And so It is not necessary for nations or people to move from one place to another, but for people to believe, for God will give them the opportunity for his house, his temple to be in all the world. And it is the hearts of people of many different nationalities, and every one of them lives in their own country. And this is what is beautiful. So it says, many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. They wanted to know the truth of God, the house of our God. Now, when Micah was speaking, our Lord Jesus Christ was in Jerusalem, alive, humanly, And it says, and he will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion, the law shall go forth. The same verse in Isaiah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It was the same. So that curiosity, they wanted to know the Lord physically. But today God is spirit and God in spirit is in all countries waiting for hearts 
to be open to him so that he may enter and dwell in those hearts. And God may then establish his temple and house in the hearts of these people from Africa, in Asia, in Russia, in all countries. God wants their hearts to open so that he may form his temple and house. What do you think of this house and temple of the Lord? It is beautiful. Let us now go to Haggai. After Micah, after Micah is Habakkuk and Zephaniah, which are very small books, and Haggai in chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2 is speaking of the temple of the Lord. In verse 1, in the seventh month, let us keep in mind Haggai the prophet, he was a prophet that lived before Jesus Christ, a prophet that existed before the deportation and those that arrived back from the deportation, they arrived to come and build the temple again in Jerusalem. So God set Haggai, Malachi, and Zechariah as the prophets of that time. And after them, there was silence for 430 years until Jesus Christ came and John the Baptist. Here in Haggai in chapter 2, in verse 1, it says, In the seventh month, on the twenty-first of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, governor of Ju Judah, and to Joshua. Now, this is not Joshua from the book of Joshua. This was a different person who was a priest. And to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? So he is saying to those who had returned from Babylon, that let us remember Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple and the cities were burned, and they were taken as captives. About 4,000 plus people went to Babylon and lived there for 70 years, and after that they returned back to Jerusalem to rebuild it again, to rebuild the temple, the walls, everything. This is why these people who say, who, who of you saw this temple, the one that was built by Solomon? Remember the temple that Solomon built? Do you remember? And someone might say, well, yes, I remember the temple or my fathers told me of it. And it says, and how do you see it now? For they had built a simple temple because they did not have money. And this temple or house was so simple. And some wept. Those who knew of the temple of Solomon wept in seeing this very lowly, simple, and poor, materially made temple. They cried about that. And those who had never seen the temple of Solomon and seeing this temple, they also cried with joy in seeing they finally had a place to go and worship God. And so they were confused. These tears became confused. And so it says in verse 3, how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yes, of course, it's as nothing before your eyes because the temple of Solomon was splendorous and this temple is not. And so here he gives them a prophecy. There is a prophecy that starts from Haggai when the prophet says, but you... Do not be so sad in seeing this house that is physically poor because look at what the Lord has in store for the future. The Lord has a temple for the future, a house that is perfect and it will be everlasting. And here in verse, in verse eight, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. He was prophesying to those that were sad and who wept with what, how that house, that temple had been made. He says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple, meaning that future glory of the temple that you are seeing, shall be greater than the former. So the glory, the glory of this temple in the future will be greater than the what that temple of Solomon was built. It will be better than the tabernacle that Moses had built, says the Lord of hosts. In this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And so here was the prophecy from the Lord that in the latter days, our Lord Jesus Christ would be building a perfect house, a perfect temple that would be forever.
and it would be filled with splendor. How could it not be filled with splendor if it is the presence of God dwelling in the hearts of those men and women, children of God? Blessed is the name of the Lord. And so what a marvel. Let us now go to Zechariah. Following Haggai, you'll find Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. Zechariah was also a prophet and prophesied for the future in those latter days. And in verse 12, it says, Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and this is in reference to our Lord Jesus Christ, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Here, this is prophesying and saying he would be building the temple of the Lord in such a way that when our Lord Jesus Christ was in Jerusalem, that temple that Herod had built, it was worthless. It had no value. Because the temple that our Lord Jesus Christ was beginning to edify, it was the main temple. It was going to be greater the glory of this temple would be greater than the former. That former glory was that physical temple. And in that most holy place, as you know, the Lord manifested himself once a year to the high priest. But as they sinned and they defiled the temple, how could God manifest himself? So God took his glory from there. He removed his presence. Now when our Lord Jesus Christ, in that time, no longer did the high priest speak to the Lord in the most high place. That had already ended many ages ago. That had ended. God had departed. And they had the temple and they gathered, but God was not present. The glory and presence of the Lord was not there. And this is why in the prophecy it says the future glory, that latter glory will be greater than the former. Because that latter glory in the future, God would be there forever. In the former, it was not. It was only for a time. And because of their sin, God, he distanced himself. But who would build this temple, this house? Well, the Lord, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It says, from his place, he shall branch out and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Verse 13, yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. So he is that priest as well. Our Lord Jesus Christ would build that temple and that glory would be greater because the presence of God will be there forever. And it is in the hearts of his children and all of his children together form the body of Christ. The body of Christ and Christ as the head. So we see that marvelous temple, that marvelous house of the Lord. Here we continue in Matthew. Let us go to Matthew after Zechariah. You'll find Malachi and then Matthew. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. 1 verse 1 and 2. Now, here in Matthew, our Lord Jesus Christ is in Jerusalem. He is humanly present. He is there physically preaching his gospel in the kingdom of heaven so that you may locate where we are in time, those that are new. And so here in 24, verse 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Now this was the temple that had been built by King Herod. And his disciples came up. And please, sorry to interrupt, let us keep in mind and let us not forget this temple that Herod had built. God did not manifest himself in that most holy place every year with the high priest. He no longer did that. This is why our Lord Jesus Christ, he saw the temple and he saw the poverty of that temple, the misery of that temple that God was no longer there manifesting himself once a year. And so I continue. And then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Then Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. What does it mean? Our Lord Jesus Christ knew this temple had no value to the Lord. That God did not manifest himself in this temple as he manifested at some point in the time of Moses. 
In the beginning and in the time of Solomon, he manifested himself in the most holy place once a year with the high priest. But no longer. Our Lord's, he, our Lord Jesus Christ knew that the Lord no longer looked at this temple. He knew he would be building his temple and his house spiritually. And it says, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Meaning, a war is going to come. And not too long of time, war will come and destroy the city. and will destroy the temple. And not one stone shall be here upon another. Only the memory of it. And so the word of our Lord did come to pass. For even to this day, over 2,020 years have passed. And even to this day, there is that remembrance. There are many people that go to those places. They travel, many tourists. And they go to observe just a wall. Just stones. Because that is what the Lord said, that a stone no longer will be left upon another because the temple, the physical temple would no longer be rebuilt because God no longer dwells in physical temples. God will not dwell in something physical, but in the spiritual. God is spirit. God is spiritual. And what he needs is hearts, hearts that live a spiritual, upright blameless life so that he may dwell in them and that is the house of God that is the temple of God the hearts of men and women of the children of God and who who perfects them our Lord Jesus Christ with his gospel because he left the Holy Spirit to perfect and to sanctify all that is the work of the Lord now we continue in Acts after Matthew you find Mark Luke John and then Acts Acts 17. Acts 17. Verse 24. And it says, Now Apostle Paul is in Greece, in Athens. He was preaching. He went to go preach. And he saw that people were uh, idolaters and they had many altars for their gods and among those altars he passed by and saw an empty altar that had no statues and there was an inscription that said to the unknown god so they had so many gods and to all of them they gave a name but there was one that there was nothing on and it said to the unknown god and they were right they did not know that god so Paul took advantage of that circumstance and he said, I'm going to preach to you about this unknown God. I will preach to you about him and teach. And that's when he begins to teach the word of our God. And in verse 24, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Do not forget to read these verses that the Lord who created the world and everything in it, he made the earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands or physical temples. He does not dwell in these places. Forget about it. This is why if you want to say, well, we're going to build a temple because I'm going to form my own religion and I'm going to make up a religion and I'm going to build a temple for God and I'm going to gather all the gold and all the precious stones, all the emeralds and all the sapphires, the diamonds, the best marble, and I'm going to build this very luxurious temple so that all the people that are in the world may know that here in this particular country there is a very luxurious temple for God and then everyone will come and see this temple so let us take advantage of it because everyone's going to come and we're going to charge them to come and observe so they turn it into a business and they turn the curiosity of people in wanting to see the most luxurious temple in the world that most luxurious temple for God with the best metals with the best woods we must see it that is a lie. That is deceit. And that is a con. For it says here, God does not dwell in temples made with hands, made by human hands. So they waste their time. If you want to waste your money in buying a plane ticket to go see the most luxurious temple, 
Well, there are people that travel and go see museums, right? And there are museums, and that's that. Those are things that existed and they were used by certain people, and and those are things are in museums. But the, the, this very luxurious temple that exists in the world, because this is where God is. Well, that's a lie. God is not there. He does not dwell in any luxurious place. We read that the heavens of the heavens cannot contain God's presence, much less something human. So the Lord said he was spirit, and he ought to be sought in spirit and truth. And he prepares hearts. Our Lord Jesus Christ, it is his work with the Holy Spirit, preparing the hearts of men and women to be children of God. So they, they do not sin and they fulfill God's will. And so God will dwell in the hearts of these men and women. And wherever those men and women go, those children of God go and travel the world, there the church of God goes with them in all the world. And that happened once with a person, a sister. She, well, her husband didn't let her go to the church. And as he did not let her go, he would not give her money. So she had no means of transportation and go to the church and congregate. So she was very sad. And in her sadness, she, someone would give her some money and she would use that to go to the church and praise God and glorify him and to receive prophecy and to receive laying on of hands. She would do that. And when her husband discovered this, he said, we're leaving this city and we're going somewhere where this church of God, ministry of Jesus Christ, does not exist. We don't want that church to be there. And he found a city and he went. He went there to go live with her because that is how he was going to be able to prohibit her from going. The church wasn't there. So the sister was very sad. And she searched for me and she said, sister, I'm going to get a divorce. I'm going to ask for a divorce because he doesn't want to let me go to church. So what happens? Now, he's saying that I need to move to a different city, and it's all so that I don't go to church because the church doesn't exist there. And as the church doesn't exist there, I'd rather get a divorce. So I prayed for her, and the Holy Spirit spoke to her and said, My daughter, do not worry. Go on that trip and travel. Obey your husband and move to that city. Do not worry about the church because the church goes with you. He said this to her, the church goes with you. Why do you worry? And we didn't understand. We didn't understand what this meant, that the church goes with you. In that time, I didn't understand because we were just starting the church at the time, just starting with the things of the Lord. And so there was no knowledge of this. And so she did go and move. She lived in that city. And three months later, the church started in that city. It started with a couple of families. And the church began. And she would then go. And so, what God spoke to her was fulfilled. The church goes with you. There, you say the church is not there, but you are the church. And she went. And with her and a group of family, another family more, that she spoke to a family of the church and said, yes, we, we are of the church, but since we live here, we can't gather, but let us get, gather and glorify God on our own. And that is how the church began, how beautiful it is. And when her husband found out, then some years went by and he said, well, now we're going to go to a different city where the church is not there. And so they left and went where the church was not there. And she knew that the church was going with her. So they went off to that other city to live. And three months later, the church began. So her husband said, no, this means something. God is surely trying to make me wake up. This is a wake up call. And he ended up going to the church and converted because he thought to fight with God and God defeated the battle, defeated him and she triumphed. So she was the church. It was her heart. This is why I say the children of God, they travel to a different planet and the church of God goes there. For example, they can go to the moon. We don't know if maybe perhaps children of God work with NASA and they have to travel and go to the moon. Okay, well, the church went to the moon. That's where the church of God is because that's where the heart of someone is. God is in the heart of a person. That is God. That is the temple of God. That is the house of God. 
And so, we are not going to say that that physical place, we're going to go revere it as some people do. They go and worship physical things. They worship and revere physical things. And they pass by the front of a place and they begin to do a lot of different things. Oh, because this is a sacred place. No, the sacred place is not something physical. It is here. That's the sacred place. Now, now I've kind of gone over time. I think we're going to have to conclude. We'll conclude here in 1 Corinthians 6. I'll leave some other books pending. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I will read very quickly because this is so important. I I lose the notion of time because I am just so happy and glad. My heart rejoices with happiness when I speak of God and I open the Bible. And so I forget about time and thinking about people's time, and I continue and I continue, and I would probably be here all day. But... I do consider, I do consider other people that maybe someone is tired or maybe someone will make a call of, uh, of attention to me for taking so long. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 through 20, these are beautiful verses. I'm going to read them, but I'm not going to give an explanation. In Acts, where were we before? In Corinthians, right? 1 Corinthians chapter... No, before before that. In Ephesians, Ephesians 2, I'm just going to read them, and I, I won't give you an explanation because with what we've explained, we understand. Ephesians 2, 21, 22. Ephesians 2, 21. Verse 20 says, Having... Verse 19, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Now he is speaking to the Gentiles, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And this is in reference to men and women who with their heart, they form the temple of God. And that chief cornerstone is Jesus Christ as the head. It says, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians... In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we were going to read chapter 6, but first we'll read chapter 3, and it says in 16 and 17. Now Apostle Paul is speaking, saying that you must work, you must be perfect, upright, and sincere before God, bearing a good testimony, preaching God's truth. Verse 15, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And do you not know that you are the temple of God? He's, he's basically telling them, have conviction and do things right. And in verse 16, he says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? Now the apostle is saying that our hearts, that is the temple of God, that is the house of God. That the Spirit of God dwells in the hearts of the children of God. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. We were in chapter 3. Now we go to chapter 6, verse 12. And we are here clarifying the house of God, the temple of God. We are that house of, the, of God and we are that temple. Verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful, Apostle Paul is saying. He says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any, meaning sin. That everything was lawful, everything could be done, but that he was not going to let himself be dominated by doing what is wrong in the eyes of God. And it says, foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them, speaking of the physical things. For there were people who said, oh, but don't eat pork. And 
don't do anything on the Sabbath because you can't do anything on the Sabbath. And so that's what he was referring to, that he doesn't care about the days. He doesn't care about foods because you eat the food and it all goes into the stomach and then it is destroyed. And he says, there are other things that are more important. Verse 14, and God both raised up the Lord and will raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him, one spirit with God, those who join the Lord. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy, Holy Spirit who is in you? It says, do not ignore that your body, it says your body, it doesn't say your heart, because how can I say that your whole body, but you say that body that is corrupted, that is sick and it wears out? He says, do you ignore that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are, are God's. So, the house of God. The house of God. The temple of the Lord ought to be human beings, men and women that convert to God, that devote their lives and dedicate them to the Lord, that they live for the Lord and read the Bible. They seek the true God, the Almighty God, so that He, through His Holy Spirit, for it says He left the Holy Spirit here on earth with human beings to help them to change and to take away their sinning tendencies, and that the person may truly please our God. And so I invite people, men and women, who have not had these experiences with the Lord, I invite you to seek the Lord, and to start off with reading the Bible, and then pray and ask God, and don't say you don't know how to pray because you don't need to learn or memorize a bunch of poems, sometimes like poems, and people say, I'm going to memorize this poem. Praying to God is speaking with God, speaking about all the things you feel in your heart and you want to say to Him, whatever you want and desire, say that to God and He will hear you. He will answer. God will bless you. God will be with you. And so God wants you to be the temple of God. God wants you to be the house of God. And so the house of our Lord, the temple of our God, it is us, that God dwells with us, that God be with us. This is what is beautiful. And the physical, now you know that the physical it is important that there should be a place to come and congregate to put the spiritual gifts to work, to pray for one another with laying on of hands and to teach the doctrine and to learn of our Lord each day so that we may be more wiser, more upright and holy. And so may my God be with all of you. May my God be with all of us. The honor and the glory be to him. Let us pray. Let us pray and do not forget your needs, your your sicknesses, place them before God. And if you desire, raise your hands if you're able to or put them on your heart and ask the Lord what you desire to ask Him. Believe God is there close by. He is close, listening. Oh, Heavenly Father, oh, Holy God, Eternal Lord, Powerful God, Creator of the heavens and earth, 
our God, who created the heavens. And as your word says, the heavens of the heavens cannot contain you. Who will go and build you a temple or a physical house for you to dwell, Lord, if you are spirit and you dwell? And you dwell with those who have a pure heart, clean hands, those who have done your will, those who do and keep your commandments, Lord. You dwell with righteousness because you are righteousness. Thank you, Heavenly Father, because you have looked up upon us with eyes of mercy and you've chosen us. You have set us apart and you have us here with promises and you speak to us and you fulfill. And we are in this path of perfection and we are seeking this perfection, Lord, so that your word, your holy word may be fulfilled when it says our Lord Jesus Christ would be raising up a church without spot or wrinkle for himself. And Lord, we, we are longing and desiring to be among the group of people of which our Lord Jesus Christ is perfecting and cleansing. Oh, Holy Father, but help us also in our duties, in our work, and in this ministry that you have set upon us to teach the world and to evangelize and to share with people of your existence and of your mercy. And help us, Lord, so that people listen to us and that your Holy Spirit may also come to the hearts of each person and that they may convert to you and praise you and seek you. Seek you, Lord, and may feel the joy and happiness that we feel, that they too may feel it, Lord, when they are seeking your face. Thank you, my God. Manifest yourself in the life of each person. Manifest yourself with your mercy, with your love, Holy Father. Lord, I also ask in this moment... For all the people that are in need, there are many people that are sick. There are many that are sick with diverse sicknesses, physical sicknesses, psychological sicknesses, incurable sicknesses, witchcraft, sorcery, the, the curses, all of these evil spirits. These people are bound and enslaved by the devil enslaved by these sicknesses lord extend your mighty hand take all of this away and deliver the souls deliver those that are captive cleanse each person and heal extend your mighty hand and lord also remove sadness bitterness and depression and stubbornness take away disobedience remove all of those bad decisions of some and remove that spirit of laziness of wrath and anger and contention, all of that that the devil uses to destroy people, to destroy one another. Lord, deliver and cleanse each person and have mercy. Give love to the marriages, to the couples, with their children, with their parents. Give love and understanding. Give affection and remove all of these evil traps. Remove this plague, this pandemic. All of this we pray, Holy Father. Have mercy, Lord. Give us opportunities, Father. And give many opportunities to people who have not heard your word of your ways. Father, in your mercy, my Lord, in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, we pray all these things, my Lord. Thank you, my Father. The honor and the glory be for the Lord. We pray and we honor you, Lord, because we, we have so understood, we've believed, and we do so. And if there is something that we are missing or lacking, Lord, teach us. Teach us what else we ought to do in order to, to convince you and to touch your heart so that you may act immediately in our lives, Lord. Act, Holy Father. Thank you for your blessing, for your love and your mercy. Thank you for your truth. Bless and cleanse all those thirsty souls for your word, those who desire to be standing before you. Give them your blessings. Give them to drink of that water of life. Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, and glory to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praises be to the name of our Lord. We will be singing to our God chorus, Happy Now. Chorus 128. It is Chorus 128, Happy Now. Soy feliz, soy feliz desde que encontré la salvación.
salvación en Cristo con amor. El Señor mostróme la verdad y vida. Soy feliz, soy feliz, siempre cantaré con dicha indecible e indestructible. Tengo paz perfecta y siempre soy feliz. Soy feliz, soy feliz Desde que encontré la salvación en Cristo con amor El Señor mostróme la verdad y vida Soy feliz, soy feliz Siempre cantaré con dicha indecible e indestructible. Tengo paz perfecta y siempre soy feliz. Blessed and praised is the name of the Lord, and thank you very much. Thank you for the patience that you have and for your time. And may my God bless you, and I love you. I send you many hugs and many kisses to you all. May God bless you. Thank you.